Well, you might also remember that there are boundary conditions for electromagnetic waves. One of these boundary conditions says that the electric field oriented parallel to a material interface, say like this, must be continuous across the interface. So let's say uh, this is material one, and we'll say it's air, just like in our grid, and this will be material number two, and this will be the PEC. Let's call the tangential electric field component in the air region of our grid, and immediately to the right of this interface, we're going to call this E tangential tan one, and this could correspond to EZ at I equal to two in our grid. So I'll write that here. So I'll put example here. And we'll call the tangential electric field component in the PEC just to the left E tan two since it's in material two. So this could correspond to EZ at location I equal one in our grid. Since the tangential electric fields must be continuous across this boundary, we can write that E tan one must equal E tan two. Then since the tangential electric fields are zero <coughs> inside of the PEC because the conductivity is infinite, then E tan two is equal to zero. And since E tan one is equal to E tan two, we can say that E tan one just outside the material must also equal to zero. Under what conditions can we always have E tan one equal to zero when we have a plane wave propagating towards the material interface from the right? So we have a plane wave propagating this direction. Well, E tan one can only equal zero over all time steps if a reflected wave is generated at the surface of the PEC that is equal and opposite to the incident wave. So we can split up E tan one. It has to equal zero, but we can split it up into an incident component for an incident wave and also a reflected component, E tan one for both of those. So if we simplify this expression, since it's equal to zero, we can write E incident part of E tan one must be equal to B minus the reflected E tan one. So this is what we're seeing in our simulation, a complete reflection of the wave at the location of EZ one. And the reflected wave is of an opposite, the electric field has an opposite sign. So now we should ask ourselves, is a PEC an appropriate boundary condition at I equal one? for our application of interest. Here's the geometry we want to model. We want to start with a plane wave propagating straight downwards towards the snow and the ground. And we define the downwards direction as being the x direction. As a result, EZ1 is located up in the sky. That would be up here somewhere. Where any propagating electromagnetic waves would in real life be able to just keep propagating upwards for a really long distance. One option, of course, is to correspondingly make our grid really, really large so that in the time span of interest, we don't see any reflections from the edge of our grid. But this is highly inefficient and also impractical for three-dimensional models. So instead, let's see if we can develop a boundary condition that we can use at EZ1 or near EZ1 that we can use to terminate the grid in a manner that makes the grid look like it's infinitely long. So I'll say look in quotes, look infinitely long in that direction. Basically what we want is the numerical equivalent of a wall of an anechoic chamber. An anechoic chamber is a room with walls designed to completely absorb electromagnetic waves in order to prevent any reflections off of the walls. An anechoic chamber also prevents any electromagnetic propagation through the walls from the outside. Here's an image of an F-16 fighter jet in an anechoic chamber. Here the Air Force is probably testing how well signals are being reflected by the aircraft, 
or whether there are any electromagnetic compatibility issues with the equipment on board, the aircraft, or something along those lines. Of course, they want to test the fighter jet as if it's in normal operation, flying around in the sky with no other objects nearby. So, of course, they don't want the walls of the room to introduce any reflections into the measurement. What's along the walls of the room of an anechoic chamber is a layer of absorbing material. And you can see that this absorbing material has a very distinctive shape, which helps reduce the reflections from the walls. So a question is, can we add a layer of absorbing material along the left side of our grid that we can use to absorb any waves that are propagating to the left? There are two things we need in order to accomplish this goal. First, we need the reflection coefficient to be equal to zero at the surface of the absorbing material. And two, the material needs to absorb the wave so that by the time the wave reaches the end of the absorbing material, it doesn't reflect and then propagate back into the grid again. Here's a schematic of the left side of the grid. This diagram shows the incident and the reflected and the transmitted electromagnetic wave at the interface between the air region and the absorbing material that we want to add to the left edge of the grid. So this is material two, and here's material number one. The gamma vector here shows the direction in which the wave is propagating. And gamma is equal to alpha plus j beta. So alpha is the attenuation constant, and beta is the phase constant. We saw these in table 7-1 that we looked at earlier. The first thing we want is a reflection coefficient of zero at the interface. Is this possible? The reflection coefficient for the electric field of an electromagnetic wave at the interface between two materials is eta2, the characteristic impedance of material 2, minus eta1 over eta2 plus eta1. To figure out if we can get a reflection coefficient of zero between the air and the absorbing material, we need to fill in some more details here. For example, we can write out the characteristic impedance of air and the absorbing material. Let's start with the air. Using table 7-1, for air, which is a lossless medium, we can see the characteristic impedance is square root of mu over epsilon. And so for air, for material 1, we're going to have square root of mu naught over epsilon naught, since those values correspond to free space. Then for material 2, we should use the expression for the characteristic impedance in the any medium column, since we don't yet know the characteristics of the absorbing material yet, whether it can be classified as a low loss medium or a good conductor or neither. We're just going to make one change to the expression that you see here in this table. From this table, we can see eta2 is going to be equal to mu2 over epsilon2 times 1 minus j sigma over omega epsilon2. But this expression only accounts for electric loss represented by sigma in units of Siemens per meter. And this reduces the amplitude of the electric field, but we're also going to allow for the analog of that, which is magnetic loss, represented by sigma star, and that has units of ohms per meter. And sigma star reduces the amplitude of the magnetic field. In order to take into account sigma star, we're going to add a term to the numerator. So now we're going to write the expression for the characteristic impedance of the absorbing material, it's going to be mu2 over epsilon2. And in the num numerator, we're going to add 1 minus j sigma star over omega mu2. And the denominator is the same, 1 minus j sigma over omega epsilon2. So this expression accounts for both electric and magnetic loss. So now we're going to plug in our expressions for eta2 and eta1 into 
the reflection coefficient equation. So we're going to get mu 1 over epsilon 1. And we're going to subtract the expression we just put on the previous slide, mu 2, 1 minus j sigma star over omega mu 2, and that over epsilon 2, 1 minus j sigma over omega epsilon 2. And the same thing then in the denominator, except now we just have a plus sign. So I'm just going to put that there to represent we have the same thing in the denominator as above. We want this reflection coefficient to be equal to zero. So I'm going to say want equal to zero. Let's take a step back and see if there are any conditions under which we can ensure that the reflection coefficient will always be zero. What do you think? 